Dr. Gutierrez. I do have an MD, so technically I guess it's Dr. Dr. Gutierrez. I uh, got my MD in 2001, I got my uh, bachelor's in 97, and my karate of Pocono karate detective license in 2013. Uh, let's put that in, let's figure out why not. Now, one of the big things I'm going to tell you is if you look at the histology, all of you have, I don't know, I, you probably haven't done too much histology, but when you look at, at the histology of, uh, of tissue, you actually find some really neat things. One of the things is the structure really does help it help it react a certain way. It actually is bone, for instance, is actually three times stronger than steel of the same weight. So if you have three three grams of of steel and three grams of bone, the bone will actually be stronger. Uh, it's especially when it comes to the actual axial compressions. What it's made up is collagen, calcium, and phosphate crystals. Calcium phosphate is actually mixed together to form the, the specialized type of crystals. Now, collagen, all of you, as you've done biochemistry, you know this. Collagen is what? Simple sense. Protein. It's a protein structure. So you, you have a mixed, a mixed pretty much a material. It's not, it's not just calcium phosphate crystals. It's the proteins and calcium phosphate crystals. Now, what that does is it actually gives you the structure. It also pretty much acts like uh, concrete and porous uh, with rebar. So it doesn't break as easy, and it has a little bit more strength. Now, one of the neat things about bone is you have the osteoblast and osteoclast. Osteoblast did what? Osteo means what? Bone. 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 Clast means breaker. So osteoclast breaks down the bone, and actually what it does is it causes demineralization of the bone. Osteoblast would do what? Create. Create the bone. And so that's actually, one of the things is these things are always being used, the osteoclast and osteoblast. If you're constantly using bone, you're gonna have more osteoblast activity, so your bones are gonna get stronger. You have less osteoblast, and less uh, usage of bone, less gravity on them, you're gonna have more osteoclast activity, and so your bones are gonna get weaker. If you're interested, how many people here are interested in space? Nobody likes space. If you're wearing that shirt, you don't like space. Okay, two people are gonna go and love space. One of the neat things that happens is if you actually look at astronauts after they come back, they usually will not in wheelchairs because their bones have actually gotten weaker through the lack of space. Now, it's actually kind of interesting is, if you can actually compress bone, you would actually avoid that. Right? So that'd be kind of a neat project to do. Okay, so the structure of bone allows for its strengths and weaknesses. You do have compact bone and spongy bone. Spongy bone doesn't act like a sponge, but it kind of goes everywhere. So when you look at it, it looks like a sponge with branches going everywhere. So I'll go ahead and do a cartoony drawing of it. So if you were to look at spongy bone, you'd have Fibers running everywhere. I'm giving it a, a shape that looks like a sponge. So as you call it, spongy bone. You actually have these corpuscular matrices going everywhere. On top of that, you have the compact bone. And compact bone looks like trees. You, you have a central hole, and then you have all of these concentric rings, called concentric. Lamella, concentric lamella. And so what you have outside is you have these big ring, like trees, running straight down. Now, that's actually what's going to be making the bone. But between the bone, you have another tissue type, which is smooth. What type of tissue do you find between bones? Some of you already do anatomy. Hypercartilage tissue. And some weight bearing joint, you have hypercartilage. This is actually a nice, smooth material. It's kind of flexible, which allows the uh, bones not to grind into each other. Now, when we're dealing with uh, just the skeleton, not looking at the ligaments and tendons, what we're actually dealing with is mostly these two, these two uh, tissues. And that's that is actually what we're going to do. And I, the next slide tells me that. Okay, yeah, I'm going to talk about changes in. Now. These are actually the two that we're going to deal with. And a lot of times we actually are dealing with uh, different diseases that can 
effect of these uh, tissues. For instance, if you wear out the cartilage, what happens? Hmm? Bones can grind together. If you wear out the cartilage between your fingers, you can get osteoarthritis, which the cartilage becomes pretty much calcified. So you end up having little bone spurs coming in there, which can actually grind bone. Another thing that can happen is if you, you can actually end up having things like cauliflower ear. Wearing cauliflower ear, the cartilage is also damaged, and it doesn't really repair itself nicely. So that's why you see the people getting those really weird looking ears that look like cauliflowers. The other thing that we can talk about is osteoporosis. Now osteoporosis, you actually lose bone density. And that's actually going to be one of the main causes of uh, skeletal problems. And I'm going to mention it again. Osteoporosis, pretty much you have more osteoclast activity. Sometimes it has to deal with low physical activity, low usage of the bones. So, for, I'm actually have two demonstrations I'm going to do. First one is actually the, uh, the sinuses of the skull. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go back over here and look at your. We're going to turn off the light so you can pause it in time. Okay, I'm going to turn off the lights. Now, what I want to, if you don't mind, yeah. one of the things you'll notice is if I put the light under the skull here, you can see that there are certain areas here, 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 here. You can actually see it here too, but if you watch here, put it up here more, you can see this areas here are lighting up. Mm. Why do those areas light up? Hollow. That's where the sinuses are. I think someone's calling. It's where the sinuses are, and it's hollow. That's actually going to be really important for the first fractures we're going to talk about. Hey, yeah, has anyone seen this picture before? Okay, one of the nice things is I like to use sports and any question mark cards to show how the anatomy works. Now, if you look here, you can actually see this gentleman is. Uh, well, the nickname they use is Cyborg. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is you see this indentation. Now, if you look closely, you'll see bruising right over the eye here. The reason is this. If you look up here, they actually did a 3D picture of a, what is felt, what would happen. You took a knee straight to this area and collapsed the sinuses. Now, this is completely different than breaking the skull in other areas. Because what it is, is you notice how that area in the skull, when we lit it, in the back, it lit up. That's actually a problem. Now, the other thing, like I said, if you look here, you can see actually the orbit has actually been damaged, too. And so that's one of the big things that we actually have. We can actually have a collapse of the frontal bone. And this one I took from the MMA. And that, it's actually kind of interesting. I actually did look at how many of these fractures did occur. And out of all the facial fractures, every fracture you can get in the face, the frontal bone collapse was present in about 5 to 12 percent. Things vary between uh, a lot of reasons. Main cause makes sense. High velocity impacts. Usually it's going to be motor, ve motor vehicle accidents. Why? Common. Huh? They're common. Well, that's, think of how fast you're moving. How fat, what was the top speed you reached when you came here? <laughs> 68. 68. <laughs> Maybe more. Uh, so think about it. You're moving 68 miles per hour and coming to a complete stop. Your head gets shot forward, hits something. That area can break. The other thing is it, can, it isn't seen in assaults. So someone can actually get hit and in the head and in an assault and break because of collapse of the frontal sinuses. Now, why is this such a bad thing to have? One of the big ones is you do have some aesthetic deformities, but you also can end up having uh, chronic sinusitis. You can end up having different uh, mucus uh, hydrocele, pretty much mucus uh, secreted cysts inside the head form. You can end up having uh, vision loss. You can end up having bacteria come in here from, uh, from other areas causing abscess, brain abscess, death, meningitis. For those of you taking micro, a lot of the fun stuff that, you know, kills people. So that's actually one of the big things is a lot of the 
in this case, as you do have a connection to other areas, these fracture of this bone can end up causing death. Okay, now, this is actually the most common fracture that you are gonna see. And for this, I'm going to take two models that I have available. Questions so far? None? Everything makes perfect sense? Okay, I'll put on that quiz. <laughs> okay, so here we actually have two models that I'm gonna bring out. They're both fake skulls. And what we see here is we see the bone of the cheek broken off. Now, again, think of what's actually over here. What did you notice on this area when you uh, put a light to it? It's hollow. It's hollow. So what can happen is, the skull here is called the zygomatic bone. It can actually get hit. If you look here, if you look at the skull over here, or you look here, you can see the zygomatic bone is its own bone. It's attached to another bone. Uh, pretty much is fused with another bone. But those areas where it fuses are still relatively weak compared to areas that were pure bone. So one of the things that can happen is people can take a, people can take a hit to the eye socket. And what ends up happening is that bone can come clean off. Problem with that. What's the most obvious problem with having a bone right here coming off? Yeah, your eyeball actually can actually drop down. You can end up having changes in vision. You can actually have a lot of problems later on. But if you notice where the fracture is, it ends up being, they call it the zygomatic maxillary bone fracture, or sometimes zygomatic, uh, zygomatic maxillary uh, complex fracture. That entire area can come off. Now this is the most, this right here is actually what most of the, uh, fractures of the skull are going to be. Again, it, over here you can see it, 40% of all skull fractures are that bone fracture. Most common uh, bone is the nasal bone, which is this one here, but they don't do anything, you just develop a big problem there. Cause of the fracture. This is actually really nice to actually see uh, certain things that you can, well, you can, it's really nice to see certain things because what you can see is it's not that big of a force. For instance, motor vehicle accidents, usually are a lot of force. But over here, one of the big things is personal altercations, which means? Did it to yourself? Huh? You did personal, it to yourself? Inter I guess it should be interpersonal. Oh. Two people get in a fight. One guy gets hit, comes off. It can occur through falls, but less likely. And it can, again, motor vehicle accidents seem to be the fallback. Everything can be caused by motor vehicle accidents and sport injuries, which means these are not a big thing. Now, one of the things is, this is one of those fractures when, when you see, a lot of times it is a sign of abuse. That's actually one of the reasons why now. Uh, does anyone know anyone who's going into a master's in social work? No? Okay. Sometimes social work, uh, a lot of the masters in social work are actually now having people take an anatomy. And in part is, they're going to have to deal with, well, this person comes in with a fracture. Could it, that fracture be a sign of domestic uh, abuse? This one's one that it is a red, it is a red flag. It, not necessarily, you know, that you have to look at the entire picture, but if someone has a, a fractured zygomat, it's something that you should be looking at other signs. Okay, the next one I'm going to talk about is called the Fort's fracture. And the Fort's fractures, you have three different types. Again, think of what you notice when you pick up a Light and skull. Type one. It's the alveolar process that comes off. Alveolar process is the part that holds teeth. Well, what did you notice happened here when I shone, put a light under it? Hmm? It become really bright, telling you it's hollow. So that's a type one. Type two. The zygomatic the. The zygomatic bone is uh, still attached. You then have the two. Got to get a real regular cross. You then have, you actually have the maxilla break off completely. So if you look at this uh, bone here, the skull here, you see this bone here. This entire bone can come clean off. 
And so the trace will end up having a goofy look. Type 4 is a little, type 4 fractures, uh, little 4 fractures are just a touch different. What ends up happening is you actually have the, the maxilla here, the zygomatic foam, and the entire thing can come clean off. So that's, that's one of them. Now, maybe cause of this would be what? What do you think? Think about how you would break them. Going straight in. Oh, yeah. Blood force trauma? Uh, usually, yeah, usually through motor vehicle accidents or oh, falls. Okay. Uh, if for some reason, this one tends to be less likely to be caused by uh, things. I mean, if you think about where your eyes are, things coming straight here, you're going to see. So you're going to move or do something to try to block it. A lot of times in motor vehicle accidents, you don't have the time, so you're coming straight in. Falls, especially if you're holding something, you may not have the time, so you end up breaking this entire section of bone off. And so you have three different types of little fractures. These are all the fractures. These are not all the fractures. There's actually always more. For instance, there's a, a fracture that can occur in a the terion, but I wanted to give you guys something a little bit. Okay. Now, how common are these? Anywhere between 6 to 25% of all facial fractures. One of the things you'll notice with fractures and incidences, the incidences have these big ranges. The reason is there's changes. Sometimes someone is, uh, sometimes there's a lot more motor vehicle accidents. Sometimes there's, uh, uh, you know, maybe if we had a colder than normal winter, a lot more accidents, more people end up having these. Uh, different things. Now, again, one of the big things, it's high energy blunt force. To the face, uh, to the face. So the main one is motor vehicle. You can get it from altercations of falling, but you're going to deal mostly with uh, motor vehicle on this one. Mandibular fractures. Again, if you remember the skeleton, if you look at the mandible, you'll see a little bit of lightning, lightning over on this area here. So you're going to see areas in the mandible where you're going to have fractures. Most of them are going to be caused by again. MVAs, which are motor vehicle accidents. <laughs> Big thing you'll notice is most fractures are going to be uh, MVAs. And they can occur pretty much everywhere. And when you look at the numbers, uh, about 30, a little just under 30, it's under 30. So you're going to talk, you're talking about most of the so if you have the mandible here. First of all, you can see how thin it actually is. The structure. Many, most of the fractures will occur about here, body. But you can also get fractures of the condom. You can get fractures of the angle. Why don't you think you get too many fractures straight here? I'll give you a hint. Look at the structure. It's an arch. If you look at an arch, arch is actually the area here tends to be relatively well protected, and blow would actually. Uh, go the other way. So instead of being up in the chin, you'll actually get it in the body support. And you can get it on both sides. Again, yeah, the most common cause of motor vehicle accidents. Okay. I'm going to have to switch to models. And I want to show you guys something really neat. And first, and that's this. If you take your right hand and you run it down the back of your neck, you'll notice that you have a concave curvature if you were looking from the back. Thoracic region has a natural convex curvature. And then your lumbar region, again, it's concave. Now, the curvature ends up giving you certain functions. It gives you certain postures that are normal. If you change the curvature for any reason, you change how, if you're not using the curvature right, you can actually change how the spine works. Uh, Actually, even going too flat of a back, you can cause changes in the folds between the vertebrae, which end up causing nerve irritation. Too much will cause nerve irritation too. So a lot of times you'll see people going in these really weird positions like this, and then they don't understand why they have back pain or back pain. Or they'll get into the other ones where they go flat back and don't know why they have back pain. You actually want to maintain that normal curvature. When you use a spine, you also are going to have a lot of other you're going to have a lot of different things that can affect how the spine works. Now, one of the things that's going to affect it is 
we have different fractions. The first fraction I'm going to talk about is the first cervical vertebrae. Before that, I'm going to go for the box. See that? I have some pictures. So, the first one is actually called the Jefferson's compression fracture, and it's of the axis. Now, the axis, that's, yeah, axis. Who knows who axis is? Atlas, I'm sorry, Atlas. Is. Who knows who Atlas was? So the, the first cervical vertebrae is Atlas. He holds up the world. Okay? As far as you're concerned, guess what your world is? Yeah. Yeah. If you lose your head, nothing else really matters after that. <laughs> so one of the things is you have a lot of things that can cause these cervical fractures. Most common causes of the fractures and dislocations are going to be, guess what? <laughs> Sometimes you get these uh, fractures not because you actually hit anything, but because you don't. The whip, yeah, the whipping punch. Uh, sometimes you actually can't get them through. You can't get them through accidents, falls. Violence is always something you can get a fracture from, although it's a lot harder than most people would realize. And sport activities. The first one I'm actually going to talk to you about is a sport activity. A lot of it has to do with just rapid accel rapid accelerations and decelerations. We're talking about it takes milliseconds for the, the action to do it. So if a lot of people think. Oh, it's force, force. Well, it's not just force. It's how long it takes that force to be applied. Sometimes people don't pay attention to, uh, don't necessarily look at how fast something gets applied. To give you an example, let's take a smart car, one of those little thousand kilogram cars. If you have it going at something like 0.1 miles per hour, and you get hit by it, what's it going to do to you? Nothing. Well, it's going to move you. Now, if you took physics, you talk about elastic and inelastic collisions. When something gets hit and starts moving, it doesn't really cause the damage because it causes the movement. Now, if you're stuck against the wall and it's pushing against you at 0.1 miles per hour, it's going to cause damage because that force is going to go into you and into the wall. And so that's one of the big things that is happening is uh, how fast the force will, ch and if there's something holding it, will determine if they're, how uh, the damage is. Now, if you took a smart car, which is uh, like a thousand mile, I actually did the a thousand, uh, I think it's a thousand kilograms, a thousand pounds, I think is what it came out to. It's going up 0 0.1 mile per hour. It's about the same force that a fastball, go, a baseball going 90 miles per hour has. Now, what happens if you get hit by a baseball going 90 miles per hour? It hurts. Probably going to do a little more than hurt. It'll probably break something. Is it going to move you much? No. The entire force of that collision goes into you in a couple, in probably a millisecond. You don't get any movement. It just hits and that's it. So most of, in the, the neck, most of the fra most of the fractures are really going to be caused by these forces acting in milliseconds. Now. The initial event can cause fracture, and it can be stable or unstable. It can be stable or instable, let's say. And that instability can actually end up causing problems to what the spinal cord, the uh, vertebrae are protecting. What are the vertebrae protecting? The spinal cord. The spinal cord. Now, depending on what the area of damage you have, you can end up having a lot of problems. So that is one of the big things. So if we do have the initial trauma event can cause it can cause the problems for the skeletal structure, and then later, if it's not stable and the person's just moving around, it can end up causing a lot more problems, neurological problems. Uh, it can actually result in injury to the spinal cord, it can end up having a lot of neurological problems. Now, interesting thing is, most people who are going to get spinal cord injuries are going to be men between 15 and 24. Anyone know why these numbers are actually kind of interesting? Has anyone taken sociology? One of the neat things is, if you look at, uh, if you look at actually uh, people when they commit crimes, it's actually the same age groups. Reason? What do you? How much are you thinking of what you're doing when you're a uh, male, fifteen to twenty-four? <laughs> Not much. 
<laughs> you're, not, you're still in that age range, even. <laughs> but no, that, that is actually one of the things is you, you do have the effects of testosterone at that time. You do have the uh, whole uh, uh, social aspect, and you know, you if you think about it, uh, if you're if you find someone racing in the street, usually they're going to be around uh, well younger than 25. 25. Once you get to 25, you're usually like, what am I doing this for? Okay, so this is actually the one I was talking about, the Jefferson's Fracture. This is the at atlas. And in Jefferson's Fracture, what happens is the skull comes crashing down directly onto it. The way this fracture usually occurs is well, the best way to actually describe it is in football, spearing. It's a reason why a lot of people want to make spearing illegal. In spearing, what people do is they come at someone pretty much charging head first. The problem with that is, think about this. You have a man who weighs probably uh, 200 and some pounds. You have another man weighing a couple 200 and some pounds. Both of them are relatively fit, strong people who can run really fast. This amount of force comes in, in one second, slams, and that forces these two areas to spread a little, causing a fracture in the anterior and posterior arches. Now, think about this. Come straight in, slam, that breaks. This is the first cervical vertebrae holding your skull up. Underneath it, you have your spinal cord, and you have, you can actually irritate some of the uh, lower portions of the brain. Someone can get this fracture, and a lot of times, especially if they're young and don't realize it, they can get up and think, hey, you know, I'm fine. And their entire skull is pretty much now kind of just on two broken bones, which aren't really attached anymore. Can you see a problem with this? I hope so. The other way people can get these Jefferson fractures is relatively the same mechanism, just you're going to hit something a lot harder. How else do you think someone would do the same thing as what would happen in spearing? Diving. Huh? Diving. Yeah, diving in a shallow water. Now, a lot of people will hear, oh, it wasn't that big of a fall. I'm five foot eight, nine, or ten, depending on who I ask. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I were to jump and land three on the top of my head, the distance that my body had traveled will be about just under six feet. So imagine in my case, 220 pounds coming straight down on the top of my head. Uh, acceleration is, what is it, almost, is it eight? Acceleration caused by gravity. Meter, uh, meters per second squared. So you actually are picking up a quick, a lot of accelerate as he comes straight down. So that's actually one of the other ways. Think about it. This is a lot of people say, "Well, it wasn't that big of a fall." Well, you're talking about six feet. You know, a little under six feet is a big fall. Okay. The other one, the next one I'm going to talk about is the fracture of the axis. This time out, I'm right, it's the axis. Uh, cervical vertebrae number two. I don't know why I couldn't say it before. But if you look at the, how the axis and atlas interact, you'll remember, I'm gonna use dice because I like to write. Never grew out of uh, that from elementary school. One of the things you'll notice is the atlas, has second cervical vertebrae. Has this big bony projection? Little things for the for the to come in. Your hole here. Little spine here. And this vertebrae ends up fitting, fitting in right into the first cervical vertebrae called the. What was the first cervical vertebrae? The one that holds up the earth. Atlas. And so you have that little projection coming up. Now, traditionally, there was a 
long time ago, someone wanted to find a humane way to execute people. And what they found is a 75 kilogram body fell six feet onto a rope pulled, set up on the back of the base of the skull. That sudden jerk would end up getting this, the second cervical vertebrae and getting it to fold on itself, cutting the spinal cord immediately. When that happens, the spinal cord gets cut, cut completely, so it's almost like doing it using a guillotine. I'm going to tell you a little problem with that. There were certain numbers that were important. One is 75 kilograms. And you know why they use 75 kilograms? 75 kilograms is equal to what pounds, probably? Hmm? Like 160, 150. About 160. Why 160? It's like the average weight of the people back then? The average weight of a male from that thing. Now, it had to fall six feet for the exact acceleration. Well, people took this, and I, I mentioned this in my class. People apparently, back, actually not even that far ago, were really starved for entertainment, I guess, and uh, going to a public execution was like the great thing it is. And so people would go watch people get killed. And sometimes someone would read the article completely. And instead of giving them the five feet, instead of giving them the six feet, they might just give them five feet of rope. In that case, you wouldn't break the neck. Instead, the person would be dangling there with a uh, trachea broken, choking on their own blood. Apparently, watching someone die isn't bad, is, I guess, well, it, that wasn't bad for them, but, you know, watching them choke on their body, that would be about a bit worse. I just don't understand why anyone would want to go see someone die. That's just me. Maybe I have issues. Uh, yeah, you, don't. you know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So that's one of the things is you, they actually did this. But think about it again, you're talking about six foot fall. Nowadays, this, this fracture called the hangman's fracture does not occur because of a hanging problem. Maybe, maybe it could, but usually it occurs because of something else. Think about it, if you have a rope behind your neck and you fall, what's gonna happen to your head? So how, if you look at this movement here, what do we call it? Hyper? Hyperextension. How do you get a rapid force hyperextension like this? Car accident. Maybe one is car accidents. Accident. <laughs> That's the cause of almost every fracture. You can say car accidents, and it's like, okay, you're right. The other thing is, in sports, if someone's running one way, another person's running another, and the hit comes right up in the front, they can't whip the head back and cause a hangman fracture. Now this fracture can be stable sometimes. So a person can be like, oh, you know, I just hurt my neck. And they're walking around with a broken spine, which you wouldn't want to do. You want to make sure that someone can put a collar in to a hospital to fix that, fix that up. Other times it's unstable, and then you can actually end up having a lot of loss of function because well, if you look here, what you're doing is you're breaking it off here and here. And that is it continues moving. Again, cuts off the spinal cord and do a lot of damage. There are variations to it. Give it a pass. Now, there are other fractures that are not necessarily, well, they can be as dangerous, but they're not necessarily as, as severe as that. So for instance, here we're talking about teardrop fractures, which about 80%, maybe almost 90%, will have some neurological uh, fallout, some neurological problem will occur to them, but it won't be as severe as if you're, you know, if you actually uh, sever your spinal cord. You can't actually have a lot of them. Now, almost uh, most of these are actually going to be due to sport complication. Not as going to be as hard as the other ones, but it can happen. So these are called teardrop fractures. And you have two types of teardrop fractures. One is the anterior, which is posterior. What causes them is the either hyperextension or hyperflexion of the neck. Usually, again, sporting up, sporting problem. Some of these will actually, again, these are really severe, severe uh, trauma. Uh, but if you think of, actually, you play lacrosse, right? Yeah. Think of some of the injuries you see playing lacrosse. Severe? Most of the time. Why? 
Because it's like high impact. Yeah, anytime you have high impact, and here's, here's the funny part, a lot of times when people think high impact, they'll think of sports like uh, boxing or football. But you can also have these high impact sports in sports that people a lot of times don't even consider as, oh, no one's gonna get hurt. For instance, if you think about, anyone play basketball? Basketball. Like on the street? On the street, no. <laughs> it's still considered basketball. If you think about it, you can end up, when people are running, you can't end up having these massive hits. You can't fall and end up having these different things. Soccer, you can't have someone kick as someone moves. Collision, you can have these really strong uh, traumatic events. And so in this case, what happens is part of the body can end up breaking off because you hyperextend or hyperflex. Uh, and we have a skeleton back there. I'll show you what I mean on Yorick over here. If you actually come over here, I like to use the whole room. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I don't think I've met you yet. No, um, I'm Christine Martin, I teach at Mesa. Oh, hi, Raphael. And nice to meet you. Good meet, great meeting you. So I'm really into bones. Oh, great, me too. So learning about fractures and even. Oh. Uh, Increasingly knowledgeable. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to try to post this on a YouTube so my any of my colleagues who may want to use it can. Now, yeah, if you actually look here at the skull, you actually can see how close. Uh, let's remove this. I always love how you can take everything off this pose. There we go. You can actually see how close the bodies are, and when you're getting these extensions. I'm sorry, extensions going back here. Reflections, you can't actually cause breaks. Little, you can pull off parts of those bones. I'm going to try to put it together so I don't. Oh, you can actually see that here. I'll put, him, I'll put it back later. <laughs> okay, so you, so you have all these different movements that can actually cause it. Now, I will tell you a little bit about other spinal problems. And first, I, first one I actually am going to tell you is herniated discs. If you looked at the spine, you'll notice that there are discs between each of the vertebrae. Verte verte and one of the things that can happen is, a lot of times through motor vehicle accidents, you can herniate the cervical discs. Now, think about it. If you wear a seatbelt, you get in a car accident, your head whips forward, and you can actually get herniated discs. I'm going to skip uh, thoracic for a little bit and talk about lumbar disc herniations. These are the ones that you always, you a lot of times hear about the uh, people with sciatica complain about. Not everyone who has sciatica has a lumbar disc herniation, and not everyone who has a herniated disc ends up having uh, sciatica. But the these are actually similar, except it actually acts more like a lever. It's a lever mechanic that causes a problem. Now, if you think about your back, you have a bunch of bones which are meant to turn, get a little flexion. But if you go to lift something here, and you lift, lift here, your force is acting here, your bulk comes back here, so you can end up popping the spine out. You can also get these sometimes by falling. Uh, I knew someone who ended up falling out of a hammock, bro he went on vacation, a uh, hammock broke under him, and it ended up uh, pushing his pelvis in a it kind of, I think that's probably an odd one. The other one that's interesting is the fractures of the uh, thoracic area. Now, a lot of these fractures are pathological fractures, meaning it's actually not the trauma, that, out an external trauma that causes the fractures. It's the trauma of normal movements. What I mean is, with osteoarthritis, uh, osteoarthritis osteoporosis, not it, really, what you can actually end up having is you can end up having the normal curvature, just the, uh, you can have compression fractures of the thoracic vertebrae, causing a excess curvature of the spine. Uh, you have talked about uh, scoliosis, which everyone has it to a degree. Some people are born with a little more, a lower doses, where uh, as you get uh, bigger and become more of a lord. You know, the flanks you get pulling up. You can also get it as, as you remember if you're uh, pregnant. So, you can tell. 
it has you have your facade you can probably use that but that deals with pain on your back. <laughs> okay, rib fractures. Now, here's actually the funny part. A lot of, about rib fractures. A lot of people will tell you, oh, you know, your floating ribs break, your floating ribs break, your floating rib ribs break. And the funny part is your phone. Think about it. If you have a part, if you try to open and close your hand and you have something putting pressure on it, it becomes harder and harder. So you can end up having a lot of complications due to pneumothorax. You can also you can end up uh, puncturing a lung making that lung not necessarily function. Uh, you can even, you can break up while you have an artery running over there. So you have all these different things that can happen from rib fractures. It's actually a kind of an interesting thing. You look at the bones and everyone thinks of, and they are strong, I mean, if you think about it, about three times as strong as steels per weight. Yet all these different things can end up happening to them. Okay, now, we're gonna go into arm fractures. And I'm not gonna talk about every arm fracture because that go not, that we go nuts with that. But I'm gonna go into it. Now, one of the things is you'll notice that I added the arm fracture, the clavicle, the arm fracture. What's the difference between the clavicle and every other bone in the arm? Actually, a couple of other ones. It's made with intramembranous ossification. Most of them are actually endochondral ossifications. The clavicle is made intramembranous, and its long shape causes certain problems at birth. This bone can actually be broken during birth. How? Oh. Baby's coming out. You have compression of the uterus here, here, and that S-shaped pattern steps in the middle. But I wanted to show you something. When we're dealing with long bones, one of the things to remember is long bones are compact bones, which I told you about earlier. You have spongy bone inside, and then you have a hollow cavity in the middle. In essence, long bones are hollow cylinders. And like I said, I wanted to bring this for a reason. Now, one of the things, if I really wanted to do this right, I would have thousands of these, and I'd arrange it around, and I'd put a little other paper thing holding and have a hollow cavity. But that's not a, as dramatic as this. Think about this as your bone. You have your medullary cavity, we use that as the cortex. And we'll put it here. So what should happen? Now, what do you notice about the, the strength of the shape? It's pretty durable. Now here's actually something funny. And of course I'm going to do it and I won't do it this time. One of the things is bones actually don't bend. So any little trauma to the side, if you have the force coming down here and you have a little bend, what usually happens is bone breaks. Bone doesn't bend. There's actually something called uh, Young, I think it's Young's coefficient or Euler's coefficient. I can't remember, sorry. But there's a mathematical coefficient of how much some how much something can bend before it breaks? Bones don't have one. If bones are bending, they're usually breaking. The only difference is children's bones. Children's bones, they actually do have some give, so they won't, if you grab, if you, if they bend, sometimes they get just partial breaks, it's called a green stick fracture. And so, we're gonna deal with adults of this. If you get into kids, you have a lot of other things that can happen. And one of the things, before I go on with kids, you can have slipped up the seal plates in a lot of different areas, which can end up causing a lot of problems, which is just pretty much the cartilage between the, uh, where the growth plate is, slips. And what that could end up happening is, one of the legs, if it happens in the legs, one of the legs will end up being longer than the other. Uh, they say that everyone has some variations of length and legs, just naturally. Use a whole inch. See, that's a whole inch, you can measure it later. Okay. Clavicle fractures, so all fractures, we're talking about you take every fracture in the body that can happen. Anywhere between 10 and 16% of these fractures are gonna be clavicular fractures. Meaning if someone's going to, if someone's going to have a fracture, clavicle's a good one to have. Clavicle's a main one to have. But here's actually the neat thing about it, is it, unlike most fractures where you're seeing these big injuries, clavicles are actually minimal injuries. 
Uh, minimal actual trauma. It's not actually as much trauma as you would think. Uh, usually it does occur through either direct or indirect trauma. Direct or indirect trauma. Direct trauma would be you're playing football, someone runs in, hits a clavicle, the clavicle breaks. The neat thing about how the clavicle breaks is most bones, when they break, they go in the direction they break. The clavicle, when it breaks, because of the musculature, it comes out. So you end up seeing a big bump here. And the humerus will slide forward, so you'll have But you actually can end up, you'll end up seeing a clavicle fracture from the front. Now it is associated with uh, some high energy traumas and multiple traumatic injuries. It can be seen in falling. For instance, I'm holding a ball and I'm running and I fall on my shoulder. That can end up causing a fracture. And it's the, fra it's the fracture that occurs during your contractions and birth. The reason that's so important is this. Sometimes what happens is uh, pretty much uh, during the birth, baby's too big, get a stuff, and that compression ends up causing a fracture. The problem with that is underneath there, none of you have taken uh, neuro yet, you have a collection of nerves. And sometimes you can end up damaging those, uh, that nerve plexus. Uh, and then you end up having neurological problems later on. Like, uh, pretty much. All the time. Now, if you look at the clavicle, most of the fractures are going to be caused right in the middle. You're going to have about 5% and 15% on lateral and medial ends, but almost all of them are going to be middle. The reason it has to do with the structure again. Uh, for lateral, you actually would have a direct flow to that area. You can actually, uh, medial direct flow again. Uh, middle can actually be an indirect flow here, direct flow here. So the structure of the bone allows it to break a certain way. Questions so far? Yeah. Um, can, I was going from a, a boyfriend to my childhood, my friend fell down the stairs and mm -hmm. broke her clavicle. Would that be a possible thing? Or yeah, well, yeah. Because there was suspect of child abuse. Yeah, Cla clavicular fracture, that's actually one of the things. Clavicular fractures happens in such a you literally can fall, even sometimes even on an outstretched hand, mm -hmm. and the force just, just yeah. The back. Yeah, it, I mean, it had a lot to do with the structure of the clavicle, that is shape configuration. If you fall and the force is moving this way, your force of your body is moving this way, so you end up having a vocal point here. And so yeah, a clavicular fracture could, and that's why a lot of times, you yeah, know, there's a lot of fractures that alone could be, well, you know, accident, anything. When you start seeing a lot of fractures over and over, that's when you start thinking, okay, there's, there's something that's happening. There's something yeah. going wrong. And so one fracture, especially something like the clavicle, a lot of times wouldn't necessarily be it. Now, if you have a clavicular fracture and the rib fracture on the other side, then you start thinking, well, something's wrong. Uh, and that, and like I said, that's actually one of the reasons why it's, it is important for uh, uh, social workers, especially when they're getting the master's degrees, to understand basic anatomy. Because without this, they really can't get the, uh, they really, you know, it's a fracture. Well, did the fracture happen because they fell? Or was it a defensive wound or an offensive wound? These two that I'm going to talk about, the radial fractures, tend to be uh, pretty much fall wounds. These are actually the ones that you can say, these are probably a fall. Doesn't mean that they didn't have abuse, if they got thrown, that's one thing. But radial, if you have a clavicular fracture and a radial fracture, it could be a relatively severe fall. And this is a colleague's fracture. Now, what you see is you see it breaks on the distal end of the radius. And it breaks usually from falling. You fall, you try to stop yourself, radius count breaks, and they call it a dinner fork deformity. Because if you look at the wrist, the wrist will be coming here, and this will come out having that support. Now this is, like I said, normally caused by natural movements. A lot of times, a uh, big thing to actually look at is a lot of people might say, well, would think again, oh, this isn't that big of a deal, it's a fall. Again, think of how much you weigh, and think of how many feet are between your shoulder and your hand, and you're falling. On top of that, you're actually also using the lever mechanics to 
cause more damage of the wrist. So that's Pauli's fracture. A friend of mine used to, when we, we had to memorize all the names of the fractures and how they were caused and what they were caused, what he said is, when you're wondering, thinking about Kali's fracture, it happens because you were petting a dog. You pet a Kali, and you fall. I know, lots of okay. The other one's called the Smith's fracture. Smith's fracture is a little odd in that it's going the other way. The reason is, instead of falling and trying to brace yourself here, this is a fall, and you fall, bringing your arm up this way. And so chances are it's more of a uh, sport injury, falling, hitting on the side. Now, if you notice, it's the radius that's actually almost always breaking. The ulna isn't. The reason is this. When you go into, if you go into an orthopedic uh, textbook, they'll actually talk about the support column of the hand. The support column of the hand, even though your anatomical position is here, when you're actually doing putting pressure on it, it starts with these two fingers, which would be what? Second and third metacarpal. Well, the fingers would be second and third flange. Goes going down the second and third metacarpals, going to the radius, and then it actually crosses over to the ulna. If you're because if you think of putting pressure on your hand, see, well, it would be here. So all your pressure is on the right. Radius. You're, it's not in the ulna until it crosses over. And then on the radial side, you actually are kind of like dangling there. So that's why the uh, radius breaks on an outstretch unit on a fall. Now, there's another one which the name was, it's actually Megatelli's fracture, but it's also used to, known as a nightstick fracture. Um, so, uh, so about falling, what's like the most efficient way to fall then to like reduce, like for example, if you're snowboarding or skating, no, like? I think it's... Uh, actually, they, uh, they say that the way they used to teach uh, horse and horseback riding, I guess they have a, a way to fall, judo, uh, aikido, they actually teach you how to fall where you, instead of falling on your arm, you actually tuck and roll. That apparently is the best way, unless there's something ahead of you. Oh, I was going to say, I had an ulnar fracture when I was a kid from roller skating. From roller skating? Yeah. Actually, that's the one interesting thing is usually, if the ulnar fracture is, it's usually on the elbow area. Well, it's right here. Oh, you got it on, on, the, on the head? Yeah. Okay, that's like, on the head, it's actually, uh, it, it is an interesting rare. In the mid shaft, it has a specific name. It says a night stick fracture. Mm -hmm. Now, night stick fracture, you know, the, the ulnar head, Fall, yeah, why not? The elbow, the hard fall, falling off a bike. Yeah, I knew someone who broke the ulna in three places for falling off a bike. The nightstick fracture, it's really hard to break that up with a fall. Now the reason it got its name is, well, based on based on its name, well, why would someone get this fracture? I'll give you a hint. So Let's say you were working at a company and you decided to strike. What the company would do is they hire police or uh, private security to get you off their property. How do they get you off their property? Yeah. Swinging. Actually, if you read some of the massacre, uh, Union massacres, they've actually done some really horrible ones where I think it's, I wanna say there was one, was it, I think it was in South Dakota, where they pretty much came to a mining village and just shot everyone. Yeah, you know, it's like this whole, oh, you know, we don't, we don't need protection from people. It needs to be pretty bad. Nightstick fracture pretty much is the nightstick's coming down and what, to your head, and what do you do so you don't get hit? Okay. Now, if you have a nightstick fracture and they tell you they fell, probable? Probably not. That's actually direct trauma coming down. Now, the interesting thing is some people actually, I actually talked to someone who went to a self-defense class where they told them to block with their forearm. The problem with blocking anything with your forearm is it can break. So don't use your ulna if you're uh, trying to do any defense. Do something else. Now, there is a couple of questions I'm gonna talk about the purple area. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of the hands. Fingers, I'm not gonna talk about. Uh, Fingers break and you just tape them up. No, no big deal. Uh, unless they start going 
unless they start getting really interesting colors, then you know, it's a little bit. So the first one is the fracture of the scapula. Now, can you do your thumbs up sign? You see two tendons here, and you see a little space here. That's called urea anatomical snuff box. That's also the location of the scaphoid fracture. And I swear I want to, I want to write a book on how to, medical excuses to get out of anything. And if you need two weeks off, the scaphoid fracture is what you want because a lot of times the scaphoid doesn't show up on X-ray for two weeks. If, a, if you look at the bone, it's irregularly shaped. And so sometimes before it has calcifications, it doesn't show up. And so it has to actually be, it's an occult fracture for about two weeks after injury. So it has to be based on clinical presentation. Now, what that means is they think they have your scaphoid fracture. It should be casted and then x-ray two weeks to see if you have a fracture. There are certain people who say that with different type angles of x-rays, you sometimes can see the fracture. But I don't know many people who, uh, would be interested in putting their licenses on the line on. Yeah, this, this fracture was there and uh, I missed it. So, usually, but yeah. Is that the same as the navicular? Yeah, yeah, it's the navicular scapula. Now, the other one that happened, that's just a scapula fracture that happens here. I'm looking at the time. Oh, actually, no, I didn't think I put 2.30. So. That's why I want to give you guys time to ask questions if you want. Now, on the other side, we have a bone that has a hook over here. Who remembers that the bone with the hook gets called? Lunar or no, hammy? The hammy. Now, there's a fracture that's called the hammy, the uh, driver's fracture, and it's a fracture of the hook of the hammy. Now, the way the hammy, the hammy breaks, it was originally because when you, the person who was driving a car would have to crank the car, and when it turned, when the engine turned, sometimes it'd come back and slam against the hook of the hammy breaking. Now, usually we see it in beginning golfers. I don't golf, so don't laugh at me. So if you think about a golfer coming here, coming down and hitting the ground instead of the ball, that force that was coming here now ends up going this way, and to the hook of the hammock, which would end up breaking the hammock. And so that is one of the big things. It is painful. I've never had it, but that's what they tell me. And it's just one of the other fractures, like I said. At this point, I knew I was going to be rushing for the rest of them. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you something that's really kind of funny. I actually have found some really odd papers on different types of metacarpal fractures. Now, all the bones of the wrist here are called your carpals, collectively. Metacarpals, anyone know what meta means? Next to. Next to. So the metacarpals are the bones next to the carpals. And there used to be a time when they used to talk about boxers fractures and barroom fractures. Barefoot, barefoot boxers would sometimes get fractures of the heads of the second and third metacarpals. A, a barroom fracture used to be a fracture of the first and second metacarpals. Well, this is actually a time where boxers, a lot of times boxers were barefoot, didn't use gloves. And so if, you, if that was your profession, you do really well not to hit certain, uh, certain parts of your hand. Nowadays, any metacarpal fracture can be referred to as a boxer's fracture, but most commonly it's the fourth and or fifth. Now, the reason this happens is again, our bones, I know they're not perfect cylinders, but acting like a cylinder. You take your fist and put it with these two knuckles straight on the desk, what you'll notice is you'll notice almost a straight line going through what we call the, and if you line it up perfectly, so you're going straight, you end up having the force going directly through this fork column of the hand. Now, if you actually go at the fourth, fifth, and third, you can't do all five, sorry. What you'll notice is, every, if you get the fourth, everything's at an angle. So what ends up happening is the first, the uh, second and third are coming down in axial compression. The others are coming down at an angle. Now it can also cause, uh, it can also cause dislocation of the fifth metacarpal, but we'll deal with those fractures. And again, you can actually see the fracture here. This is the fifth. And it can be the fifth, fourth, usually it's the fifth, fourth, 
those are 10% of all hand fractures in the fifth metacarpal or fourth. So out of all the fractures you can get in the hands, 10% is here, 10% is here. Not a good way to function. There's another bone that has 10% of all hand fractures. And this one can actually be either Rolando's or Bennett's, depending on how much damage is done to the articulate surface over here. Now, what metacarpal is this? First metacarpal. Here's actually how this one works. Someone throws a ball. Someone goes to catch it. Instead of catching the ball in the palm of the hand, they pull the thumb back. As the thumb gets pulled back, you'll notice that there's pressure at the base of the metacarpal. And that can end up breaking this. So you don't want to, you want to actually avoid, you want to always protect your thumb from having that happen. If that breaks, a lot of times it's, if I remember, from what I remember, it's usually something people worry about if you look at how much movement you need at the base, usually it ends up leading to, a lot of times it ends up leading to internal fixation. But I'm sure that there's some orthopedic surgeon, somewhere who has experience who will say, no, no, it's, it can be it can be cast and it'll be okay. Uh, but yeah, that's that's actually your Rolandos or Bennett's, depending on how much how much uh, damage you have. That's also, by the way, ten percent. So just with these three bones, you have thirty percent of all hand fractures. Now, when they're talking about hand fractures, a lot of times they're actually including the stuff like the radius, the fingers. Uh, a lot of times some people won't have the fingers. So uh, there's actually some bones that there are, I actually found one bone where it had like a, out of all the carpal fractures, it was 0.011%. Uh, but you know, some of them, they actually just say, even with 0.01% of uh, all fractures, then you have some that say, oh, they're all, they're just very rare. Moving on to the legs. I know I'm going really quick. But what, you're, what you should be seeing now is that you're, you actually can see how these angles, how these fractures actually happen. Now the femoral head, the femoral neck fracture is an, an interesting one because it can happen to different people. One of them is it can be a stress fracture from too much activity. What this means is you have some people who, you know, they're going to play 12 uh, volleyball games at one day or they're going to do you know, massive amounts of marathon, and they're doing it one after another after another. And what can end up happening is, due to the wear, due pretty much to just the wear of, the wear of the body of this uh, area, the neck can fracture. Now, when you look at the neck, you can actually see how it, it's pretty much forming an arc. Here. You have the pubic bone, the uh, acetabulum here, coming over here, come the other leg. So you actually are putting all the pressure here, coming down this way. This is where you're actually going to have your fractures. And so you can't get them from either. You can't get them from either overuse or direct trauma. Now these are actually usually if they're an, an otherwise healthy adult. It would be this. MVA means what? Motor vehicle accident. Motor vehicle accident. You're talking about really high speeds. Reason is, if you think about it, this, this bone is really well protected. It's actually one of the one of these strongest. The way it usually breaks in a lot of people is due to osteoporosis, and this can actually break one of two ways. Just like the uh, the uh, thoracic vertebrae that can break under their weight, with osteoporosis, you can end up having someone. Who their bones are so demineralized that they go to stand. And that action of shifting the weight from one area to another is enough to break the neck. And so you have some cases where people will actually stand, break, and then fall. The other one is someone can lose balance. And if you lose balance, you then fall into the ankle. Ankle, you can actually break that. The third way, it really can be one of two things. It can be overuse. It can be just a abnormal movement, but all, 
you can actually get avascular necrosis from any of these, or you can get avascular necrosis that ends up leading to a hip fracture. Avascular necrosis pretty much means the blood supply is no longer there. Now the reason that happens, and this I don't have the picture of, but if you, actually some of you already know this, you have an artery that comes around here. It goes around the neck of the femur. What was that called? I don't remember. Circumflex. Circumflex artery. Okay. And the arteries can end up coming over here to feed the head. This is actually a weird structure in that most bones will have blood mostly going inside. Over here, you actually have a blood vessel coming on top. And you can end up losing that blood supply, which will end up leading to the death of the bone. There's a fracture called, I'm going back down, and I'm getting, I know I'm going quick. I do want you guys to ask, be able to ask questions. Of There's a fracture called the boots fracture or boot top fracture. And I will tell you that I've actually talked to people who mistake the boots or boot top fracture for what's called the marches fracture. It's two different fractures, and that's why the boot top is actually a better name to use. Because it tells you where the fractures happen. If you have a boot, where is your, what bone are you going to put a lot of pressure on? What is this? Tibia. Tibia. Now, usually the boot that causes this is going to be ski boots. And so boot top fracture is actually the fracture of the tibia. Why not the fibula? It's covered in muscle. It's actually mostly covered in muscle. It's also not supporting the weight. Now, if you think of skiing, you're here, you're bending, and your, your boots are really rigid. And so you end up having the, the tibia being kind of forced over and over that part of a hard bone, hard uh, boot, causing a bit of a fracture. That's why it's usually seen on skiers. If you have really hard boots, you can probably see it there too. You have another fracture of the tibia called a footballer's fracture. Now, who's a footballer? Here's the thing, if you're talking about American football, you call the person who plays American football a footballer. So who would be a footballer? A soccer. a soccer player. So here's actually the thing. A footballer's fracture is usually found in soccer players. What happened, what, anyone play soccer? Where do you get most of your damage? In tibia. How? People kick you. People kick you. So here's the thing. In the diaphysis, the lower end of the diaphysis, you can get hit over and over again. And it can affect the fibula as well, but usually it's direct problem to the tibia. There is another type of fracture that we're actually starting to see in the tibia now too. And that's actually, uh, there was, with MMA, there's a lot of people who are using a kick where it uses a tibia. And what can happen is the tibia hits something like the medial epicondyle of the knee. And so the shaft of the tibia being a hollow cylinder my arm was a tibia, it would end up doing this. The problem with that is when the person sometimes tries to land again. Sometimes afterwards, the person kicks and tries to land. Now that weight isn't just going on the tibia, which is busted. You can actually end up having the fracture of the team. Not a tibia one, like that too. Not a football head fracture, but. And this is one fracture that I really love to talk about. And I, I found this picture and I thought it was great. Uh, the person who drew it said it's fair use, so. And now I'm seeing why it doesn't show up that well. But one of the things that happens is if you go to your tibia, you have a big lump in the front here. What is that lump of bone in the front of the tibia called? Tibial tuberosity. Tibial It's attached to a big muscle here. What muscle is here? Hmm? Vastus medialis? No, vastus. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, rectus femoris. Uh, it's actually rectus femoris. We'll have some, some stuff with the other one, the vastus lateralis medialis and intermediate. But we'll use the rectus femoris. And what ends up happening is little kids, especially, they can actually pull the tibia. <laughs> <you're not> really <laughs> <laughs> they can pull the tibial tuberosity off the tibia. Usually, what happens is you have a kid who's maybe slightly overweight, and someone wants to help him lose his weight, so he's going to have him run over and over. 
and the bones aren't mineral bodies like yours and mine. And so they can end up pulling part of the tibial tuberosity. So, yeah, you, you don't overrun the kids. Not a good thing. Okay. I'm actually going to talk about a couple more fractures. This one's actually a fracture that it usually, what ends up happening is instead of the fracture happening, you can usually tear the ligaments of the ankle. But sometimes when someone rolls their ankle, they can break the malleolus itself. And you do have Weber's, uh, you do have classification, and it's just as if the fibular malleolus, fibular malleolus, which is a little more stable, or fibular with fibular malleolus. And what it is, it's the, the action is that rotation of the foot, that rolling of the ankle, and for some reason, the ligaments are strong enough not to break. The bone breaks. This is what I love to talk about. 2% of all fractures, but 60% of all foot fractures, are calcaneous fractures, and they call them lover's fractures. The, name, the reason they're called lover's fracture is it has to do with a uh, person lands, a person would land on his foot if they jumped off from a one-story coffin. <laughs> Why do they call it lover's fracture? That's one of, there's two stories, supposedly. The first one I like more. No, I like, the, I like the first one more. The first one is actually, the tears of the second one. The first one is, you know, the kid's in love, and the guy goes up and, you know, to the balcony to meet his, love, you know, his girlfriend, and after the kiss, he jumps down to show how, and lands on his calcaneus which is the big bone on the foot. And the way it, he lands, he breaks it. I, could, I don't think I found a good picture of it, but I didn't think what I was. The other one is the one he was talking about. The guy's with uh, his lover and her husband comes home early. So he runs out of the uh, balcony, jumps, and breaks it. And you can see here, calcaneus here, so the heel bone, and you can see all the fracture there. Now, sometimes it is stable, sometimes it's unstable. But one of the first signs that you see is, obviously you're going to have pain. You can get a hematoma that ends up filling in this area here. So you can end up having a hematoma on the sole of the foot. You will usually have bruising, but all, one of the things is, a lot of the signs that people get when something breaks don't necessarily show up. See? Or they may not necessarily show up right away. I mean, someone could break their calcaneus, just have severe pain and not show any of the signs for a couple days. And all of a sudden, it's like they get home and it's like, oh, now it's purple. Okay. Now, I told you how about the boots fracture. And there's actually something called the marches fracture, which some people don't understand the difference and they will actually mistake it. Marches fracture, and I, I can see why. Marches fracture usually occurs to your 18 year old military. It's a physio. Too. It's a physio. There's actually certain things that happen, which is fatigue with muscles. Uh, as we're getting close to uh, Oktoberfest, they have the challenge where everyone stands like this, and about a couple seconds later, you see people see on scaling. Nerves can fatigue, and bones can fatigue. And when things get to a level beyond fatigue, they break down. And that's what happens in March's spring. This is it, I swear. So, wow, in two minutes, I'm gonna finish early. You have another one called the anterior divulsion fracture. And this one, what happens is, the, uh, if you look at the foot, I have a foot here, maybe you can't see the ligament there. But if you, look at, uh, if you look at a foot, the fifth metatarsal, the base, has a little projection. What happens is, as you spin on the fifth metatarsal, that can actually break. What's more common is it happens when a dancer lands wrong. Usually, uh, usually if, they dance, uh, if a dancer lands wrong, it has to do with fatigue. So it's one of these things that happens because someone is dancing 
talk far too much, or it's spinning you on the wrong side of the foot because they don't understand that you want to spin on the first and second metatarsals instead of the fifth. So one of the things you actually did is, you, if you notice, a lot of the things with uh, fractures, it really is an idea of uh, an oddity. Some of them are massive amounts of force, but a lot of the more common ones, it's someone twisted the wrong way or something. The, the movement is actually the angle of the bone is being used in a way that isn't mechanically proper. Uh, there are a lot of other fractures, and a lot of them are really fun to talk about, but I figure for an hour and a half, uh, that's probably enough. Are there any questions? No? Uh, great, well, thank you for showing up. I know you told me your, did you put your professor's name? Yeah, yeah. Good, Patricia Moore? Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks for